Hello, and welcome to Business 101. I'm your professor, John Harvey. In this lecture, we're going to be covering Chapter 15, which is discussing the third P of the marketing mix. So we've talked about product, we've talked about price, now we're going to talk about place or distribution. Chapter 15 begins the distribution of products discussion. Now within this, we are talking about marketing intermediaries. These are your middlemen, if you will. They're the ones that help move goods or services from the producer to businesses and from businesses to end consumers. So ultimately, they take your product from the manufacturing to the end consumer. Now the marketing intermediaries that we'll be discussing are grouped up into these categories of wholesaler, retailer, and agents and brokers. The wholesaler is the one that sells uh, your product to the other organizations. And those other organizations are usually the retailers. Now the retailers are the ones that sell your product to the end consumer. So you go from manufacturing to a wholesaler, from wholesaler to a retailer, and from a retailer to an end consumer. Now, this might seem confusing, but we actually have some pretty good diagrams to explain this in more detail. Now, an agent and broker, those provide a service of bringing the buyers and the sellers together. Now, don't worry, we're going to discuss these in more detail as we get further into this. Now, there's a discussion that pops up very quickly when you start talking about middlemen, and that is, um, what kind of value are they really adding? And uh, can I just cut out the middlemen and make things more efficient for myself? So let's take this discussion of value and cost and, and efficiency and break it down into uh, something a little more tangible. So if I was to take a dollar of food, say, uh, say I'm buying a box of cereal or something. Okay. If I look at the price of the product itself, um, that's the amount of money that goes to the farmer, which is, in this case, 25 cents out of a dollar. The rest of the, the distribution, or the rest of the money, goes into the process of bringing that product from the farmer to you as a consumer. So you can make an argument that, you know, roughly 75 cents of this is handled in the distribution. Now, you make this case and say, hey, if, uh, if my cereal is costing me a dollar, why don't I just go directly to the farmer and save myself, you know, 75 cents? I'm sure that would be a much better deal. Uh, it's a good question, and it's a very common question. The, the piece that we miss on this is that uh, within the distribution channel, each of these partners that help in the process are more efficient and more effective than any one person could, could be. To give you an example, if I was to buy a box of cereal in the store, uh, say it is, say it cost me a dollar, you know, just to kind of hold to these examples. Now, if I was to cut that out and say, I'm going to buy it from the, the farmer, or in this case, the producer of cereal, what that means is I would need to get in my car, I would need to travel to whatever manufacturing site that makes that cereal, so it's probably in, you know, in the Midwest somewhere, so I'm driving to Ohio or, you know, somewhere like that, to go to this manufacturer, to knock on the door and have them, um, have somebody on staff that would then, you know, open the door and say, yes, I'd like my box of cereal, and they run back to their huge warehouse of boxes of cereal, pick one off the shelf, and then bring it back to me, and then I take that box of cereal, put it in my car, drive all the way back to my house, and then eat my cereal. You can see how unbelievably inefficient and completely unrealistic this is. Fact of the matter is, the companies that handle the transportation from that manufacturer of the cereal to the grocery store or to the distribution center, they're more efficient at it. They're handling more products and they can get you know, through that process faster. They have people that are willing to drive overnight, that are willing to, you know, fly airplanes at all hours and, you know, move the product, you know, throughout the night, throughout the day, 
in a steady way and in large volume. So, okay, so maybe I got my box of cereal at the distribution center. So now I'm outside of my town at this large facility. Well, even then, if you think about it, you would get in your car and you would drive to this distribution center. And that distribution center um, would have to have parking for everybody in their town to come to them. They would need to have people on staff in order to uh, handle the, you know, the labor transaction of getting the box of cereal, bringing it to you. Okay, So then you have um, transportation costs we've talked about. And we also have the labor costs, which you know somebody's going to have to kind of handle that process. But maybe um, if I'm a grocery store, I've already got people on staff, and they're handling all of that labor in terms of getting the box of cereals on the shelf, out of the warehouse, or out of the back area, so that um, when you really think about it, it is more efficient for you, and it saves you more money to actually go to the grocery store and pick that box of cereal than it would be for you to try and get, hit that distribution center along with everybody else or to even drive to the manufacturer. So because of those efficiencies and because of that, um, that specific focus on one part of the process, you can really drive some efficiencies out of that process and make it uh, more cost effective than in any other way. So intermediaries actually can create value. They can produce or distribute or handle that process in a way that saves you money and may even add value to your product because of its timeliness, because of the other uh, reasons. And it's just, frankly, just more efficient to get that product um, in that way. So in talking about this efficiencies, uh, I try and break this down as simplistically as possible. If I have three manufacturers and I have two retailers, okay, for each manufacturer here, you can see that there's going to be two um, activities. So this manufacturer is going to need to contact these two retailers. This manufacturer is going to contact these two retailers, and this manufacturer is going to contact these two retailers. So in total, you have six transactions that are happening there between the three manufacturers and the two retailers. So three manufacturers times two retailers means six transactions. Okay. Now I'm driving this home because when you look at it and you insert a wholesaler or what we're calling a middleman in there, without any sort of political agenda, without any sort of... Um, uh, alternate you know reasoning you just look at it and say the amount of transactions is reduced by one okay those three manufacturers contact the wholesaler that's it that wholesaler deals with the retailer okay? so each of those transactions is time energy money effort um, you know it's another area to maintain and so reducing those levels of complexity saves companies money. So at a very simplistic level, you can say creating this, this uh, wholesaler reduces the amount of uh, exchanges that need to happen and therefore provides efficiencies. Now some of the uh, benefits that are created by intermediaries, let's discuss those. If you remember back in chapter 8, I believe it was, we were discussing the term utility and what a strange term that is. But if you recall, utility means the benefit. So what we're talking about is the benefits created by these intermediaries. Now we've discussed form utility before. This should ring a bell. This is where you're actually changing the form or the structure of the product itself. Uh, an easy example of this would be if you're going to a grocery store, you can go to the meat section and have the meat department uh, you know, cut your, your uh, piece of meat for you. You can get your hamburger wrapped in certain quantities or sizes or packages. Okay? That's a benefit or a value 
that you recognize as a form utility created by this intermediary between you and the, you know, the uh, manufacturer. There are time utilities that are uh, created. The easiest example of the time utility would be fast food restaurants where they are creating value by um, always being open or being open very late. You know, there are certain uh, pizza places that are open till midnight or till two o'clock in case you have that midnight or that late night craving for pizza. Okay, they're providing a benefit of, you know, having that availability to you. Okay. There's a possession utility. And this is a one that we would think about in terms of maybe a bank or a loan agency. I myself may not have the money to pay uh, for a house in, in its entirety, but I still want to live in that house. So thankfully, there's this intermediary called a bank that will give me a loan in order to purchase the house. And while I'm making payments on that house, I get to benefit or enjoy the utility of the possession of that asset. So, you know, cars are this way, houses are this way. Any time where you're taking out a loan, it's because you didn't have the money to pay for the entire, um, you know, pay the full cost of it. So, thanks to an intermediary, you're able to uh, benefit or use that possession uh, while you're making that payment. Now, there's also a place utility, which is driven by that example that I was giving you with the cereal box, right? So without having to drive to, um, you know, the Midwest to get a box of cereal, thankfully I can go to a grocery store that is nearby. So they provide a value in terms of their convenience, their closeness, right? In terms of information, uh, an intermediary really adds quite a bit of value in this way. So you think about any time where you need to gather information or pass on information. Um, generally, there's some company that's dealing with that. And so, uh, speaking generally, we can say the internet provides a great intermediary between information and, um, you know, the recipients of that information. If I want to look up that information, um, I don't have to call the companies directly. I can look at the information they post on the internet and, you know, gather that information. So there's an information intermediate. The service utility that is gained by intermediaries is one that um, you, you might pause at for a second, but really it's this entire service industry that we're talking about. And that's really uh, becoming one of the most rapidly growing and, and important areas for retailers is focusing in on service and providing that. So when I go into a store, I'm looking for some service in terms of how to pick out the right products. So having salespeople there, um, they provide that service of answering questions, directing you to this thing, and you know, pulling that information, or even you know, providing, you know, uh, helping you even just in the store in terms of locations. All of these kind of services are created by an intermediary. So uh, these are the benefits that are created through that. Now. Let's talk about the wholesaler intermediaries. If you remember the wholesaler intermediary, this is the one where you're talking from the manufacturer into the uh, into the retailer. Now, the uh, the book describes that there's a full service wholesaler and there's also the limited wholesaler. So a full service one will provide all sorts of benefits. So this is where they may provide the sales force, they might provide the communication and advertising, um, they may uh, deal with the transportation, um, they may have the loan available for the product, so, you know, they may be purchasing the product and holding it on behalf of the other one, you know, taking credit risks, um, you know, they just provide all of the services that it takes for from you as a manufacturer to get your product into the retailer. Okay? Then you also have the limited functionality. And I just want to discuss a couple of these 
in detail. Now, this term rack jobber is an old term. It's no longer being used. The other term I've heard for this is a direct store display. And what this is, is um, the merchant or the, the I'm sorry, the, the wholesaler here will provide the product and the shelving of the product all in one. So if I'm running a store and I want to provide, uh, you know, greeting cards or something like that, I may contact one of these um, display companies that will actually bring in a swiveling display stocked with the Hallmark cards on it. And so that's what the, the book is calling a rack jobber because they provide the rack and they do the job of stocking it as well. Now cash and carry is, um, there's actually stores named, like, named this and it's getting a little bit confusing because this, this area is something where they are, um, the cash and carry wholesaler is now um, reaching out to consumers as well. But the idea behind this was that traditionally you'd, you'd have retailers that would go to a wholesaler and pay cash for the product or the goods and then take it back to their store. So they would just literally buy it, but they would pay cash for it. Now, uh, the book was listing out that uh, Staples was kind of uh, one of these examples of this, but we think of Staples in terms of the store itself where you can go in, but initially that was kind of a business to business where they were providing products to other businesses. You also have drop shippers, and drop shippers are the ones that will deal directly with the uh, manufacturer and deliver the product straight to the retailer. So they're just literally just picking up the product and moving it um, for you. So they handle that distribution part of the process. So those are some of the limited functions that wholesalers may, might uh, offer. The next intermediary to discuss would be the agents and brokers. Now the difference between the agents and broker, um, well first the, the similarity between them is that they are connecting buyers and sellers together. So they are this one that finds buyers, finds sellers, and connects them together. Now as an agent, you may have a longer term relationship with either the buyer or the seller, and you might even represent the, the buyer or the seller. But a broker is, has no continued relationship in the process. So once the deal is done, the broker is out, and there's no, um, th there's no kind of long term relationship there. It's just a matter of facilitating that process. So um, might be dealing like with seasonal fruits and vegetables or something like that, um, as opposed to a, a real estate agent where you know you listed your house with this realtor agent, okay, and that agent um, then represented you in terms of that process of connecting you as the seller or the buyer with the other seller or buyer. So the amount of retailers that we have, we actually break them up into different groupings. So department stores generally focus on clothing, furniture, or housewares. Discount stores have a variety of products, but their, their main focus is, again, providing some sort of discount from what you'd see at a department store. Supermarkets carry food. Warehouse clubs provide you know, food and general merchandise but they're, they're usually like larger and deal with more, um, you know, have some sort of membership. So this would be your Costco or your Sam's Club. A category killer is one that focuses in on one specific category and dominates that market. So an easy example of this would be Toys R Us, where they focus in on toys. You don't go to Toys R Us to buy a screwdriver or a hammer or uh, even batteries. They're focused on toys. And so you go there to see the wide variety of toys. And guess what? They dominate that market. They kill that category. You know, they have the, the majority share there. Factory outlets, the idea there is that you're providing some sort of um, product directly from, from the factory. So it's generally a cheaper price because they're trying to quote unquote cut out that middleman. 
but a lot of times the factory outlet is really a um, a way for the factory to sell its um, products that maybe haven't passed quality inspection. So you might get a, a mattress that has, you know, different packaging on one side versus the other, or, you know, a pair of jeans that might have a mark or a seam that's, you know, different or something like that. Now, a specialty store is one that uh, sells a wide selection of goods, but it's in one particular category. So um, similar to a category killer, the specialty store focuses in on, you know, jewelry or shoes or something like that. Um, but if they have the majority share of the industry, then they are, they're not just a specialty store, they're the category killer. Okay? And a convenience store would be one that's literally just, it's all about location. So, you know, they, they may have a, um, um, they may sell food or other items but they're just in good locations, they're usually open very late, so they're very convenient for you as a consumer to use. Now retailers have different distribution strategies. Um, I think these uh, slides, the, the, the graphs here give a really good example of this. So an intensive distribution strategy for a retailer means that they're going to be located everywhere. They're going to be focused. Um, they're not going to be focused. They're going to be um, putting their product into as many different outlets as possible. So you might think about this in terms of a, um, a wholesaler, in terms of how they're going to um, work with retailers in that distribution. So when I say it like that, it, it might make more sense. Um, that means like, you know, the wholesaler, say they're selling music, they're going to sell it to every store, every location that they can. Now, selective would be where they, they limit it down to only a certain preferred group uh, of retailers. So examples of this might be um, if I have some sort of high-end product, I, I don't want it to be displayed at every retail store possible. Instead, I want it to only be at certain retail stores that have a certain image that's you know, congruent or, or matches um, my product. So I might focus, if I have a high-end brand or something like that, I would focus more on Target instead of selling to Walmart. Uh, as, as opposed to an intensive distribution strategy, I would then sell to Target, Walmart, Kmart, everywhere. And an exclusive distribution strategy is where you work out some sort of, you know, exclusive rights to where you're just going to provide the stuff to one retailer. What uh, an interesting one that I've seen is now in the music industry, they try and focus their uh, distribution into specific stores. So uh, Mariah Carey has done this with her product or her CD where she um, tried to have an exclusive distribution to only one particular store. I think Pearl Jam did that with, uh, might have been Target or something like that. But uh, these music bands or, or the music companies worked out some sort of exclusive rights to only provide um, that, that product to that particular retailer. So the retailer benefits because they get kind of exclusive stuff, but um, generally there's some shared marketing benefit there. When talking about the wheel of retail, this is a um, <clears throat> just a general trend that seems to happen within retailing. So, as a retailer, you focus in on you know a limited service. Um, you might not be able to get the best location right off, uh, but you work you focus on you know having low prices. Now, this is where you generally would start you know in terms of retail. So you want to you want to have low prices so that people are interested. Uh, you may just have limited products, you know, based on what you can get a hold of and who you can you know do deals with. But as you start growing a customer base and as you start um, becoming more successful, you then start looking at it in terms of well maybe I should should open up a second location, and you're going to open that second location in a in a better place, okay? You might uh, start adding, you know, salespeople to help kind of move products. Um, 
you might start expanding the types of products that you have or, or you know, getting higher quality products. And once you do that, then you start raising your price. So now you've kind of moved out of this low price and you're, you're now kind of in this, uh, you've got a better location, you've got some better services, um, your price is a little bit higher. Now, if you're successful in that strategy, then you tend to move over time into this, into this other um, area where you have a higher price, but you, you uh, justify it in terms of your status. You're like, we are the premier, the high-end provider of this stuff. You know, so um, you're okay with your higher prices because you're a little more focused. You, you know, you've got a strong customer base. People go there for a specific reason. And then what happens is, as you're successful in that, then um, new competitors start to enter. So they'll take you know, some part of what you're providing or doing, and they'll you know, provide it at a lower price. They'll trim down you know, the amount of stuff that, from what you do to maybe a more niche or, or focused area. And then they start in on this as a new retail outlet. And so you kind of have this general move uh, of retailers where you're moving into these different categories. Now, the best example that I can point to on this one is, <clears throat> uh, well, there's actually two of them that I want to bring up. So Kmart has walked through this process. They started as a low price, um, limited service kind of retailer. So if you remember, Kmart had the blue light specials. You know, people would run up the aisles. People were getting hurt trying to you know, just tear down and, and grab these screaming good deals, you know, in the middle of the store. Then they kind of moved away from that by um, having, you know, kind of better products. And they kind of hit the high point with that where um, they got Martha Stewart involved. And so she was providing her premier line at Kmart, you know, to, to um, make that, you know, that kind of higher end association there. The other one I want to bring up is one that you'll see now, and that is Walmart. So retailers cannot stay at the low price, um, lowest price um, area of retailing forever. They either need to change their product mix, or they start moving through this cycle. And even if they're changing their product mix, they're really moving into that second phase there. And so Walmart is finding that they're doing this. So even though they have an amazing distribution, low cost distribution process, um, you know, very highly technical and, and, and doing very well, they still recognize that, uh, you know, they, they're not the lowest price on every product. And um, as you see now, Walmart is starting to change their, their communication from, you know, being everyday low price or, you know, always the best price or something like that to now, you know, save more, live better. You know, so they're kind of moving into this um, <clears throat> uh, kind of a, not just the low end, but kind of this premier look. So um, Walmart is starting to kind of move in that direction, and it's just the natural uh, you know, trend between retailers. So talking about retailers, and we've talked about these, there are some non-store distribution um, avenues that you can go through. So. Some of these would be electronic retailing, and this is primarily what we're talking about when we say the internet. Um, so stores that have retail, or maybe if they don't, they might just do a, a store online. And so um, that's what we'd call the non-store distribution here. Telemarketing, this is the annoying one that you, you always get phone calls on, you know, right when you're eating your dinner, um, because they're trying to sell you something uh, by phone. You also have vending machines, kiosks, and carts. Uh, Redbox is a really good example of this, where they've taken the uh, content of videos and provided it in a kiosk form, you know, through a vending machine. You also have direct selling, um, and this is where we get into um, direct selling and multi-level marketing. So I want to kind of draw some distinctions there, and I've got some, some kind of drawings here that I think might help with that. So here I am, and I'm going to sell directly to a, an, an individual. Now, if I do that, well, what happens is I, as a person, am doing direct selling. So 
I contact this person and say, would you like to buy, you know, some, oh, I don't know, what do we call it, some, would you like to buy some books from me, okay? I've got some books to sell, you know, I may have written them or whatever, and I'd like to, you as a person to, to sell. So, we'll call this person uh, Jane. I, as John, am going to sell to Jane. That would be direct selling. Now, the difference between direct selling and multi-level marketing sales is I may actually end up having uh, multiple people that I sell to, okay? which is pretty straightforward. So I've now sold to Jane. I may now sell to Bob. Okay. Here's Bob. Hi, Bob. And now I'm selling to Bob as well. This is a direct selling model. This is where I am selling. Now, the difference between this and multi-level marketing is where um, I may be selling books and I'm selling them to Bob, but in multi-level marketing, I am now encouraging Bob to not just buy the, the books, but also teaching Bob how to sell products himself. So now I'm going to teach Bob to sell to um, two other people. So now as Bob sells to two more people books, the difference is when he makes a sale, um, Bob makes a sale, he gets some money for that, right? Just like when I sold to Bob, I got some money, right? But in, in a multi-level marketing, what happens is when Bob makes a sale, I get a commission as well. And so it's this point right here that makes the difference between a direct selling and a multi-level marketing. Because now I'm invested in not just selling books to Bob, but helping Bob in turn sell books. You know, so I'm getting a commission here, and so is Bob. Okay. And so you can see um, just kind of graphically here that this can turn into um, what people would refer to as like a pyramid scheme. Now, the difference between a pyramid scheme and multi-level marketing is primarily that a pyramid scheme, there's no actual product. This is where, you know, you give me 20 bucks and I'll show you how to make, you know, $200. So you give me 20 bucks and I say, go tell five people to give you 20 bucks to show you. There's no product involved and that's technically illegal. Now, in multi-level marketing, that is a legitimate marketing channel. This is where companies can make a decision to spend the money in marketing in terms of advertising like commercials and billboards like we've seen, or they can spend that money in terms of creating um, these commissions and these commission structures so that I as, a, as an independent representative can now um, start focusing and, and making uh, additional product or additional sales. When we're talking about direct marketing, this is where uh, we're talking about any sort of activity that you're taking the manufacturer or the intermediaries and connecting them with the ultimate consumer. So easy examples of this would be um, the Sears catalog, where you know I'm I Sears am a intermediary, but I'm reaching out to the end consumer. So that's what we would call direct marketing. So when we're talking about the um, this, this channel of distribution. We talked about the supply chain in a previous chapter. And here you can see the supply chain includes the supplier. If we exclude the supplier out of the equation, we're talking about manufacturers, wholesalers, retailers to the end consumer. That's our channel of distribution. Okay? This is how we're moving the product to the ultimate end consumer. Now, in each of these steps, we've talked about, um, you know, different how you uh, market or you promote to them differently, how you work or interact with them. But you ultimately have a concern, and your concern is, hey, uh, I've got a premium product, and I'm selling to this wholesaler. I want to make sure that they're moving it 
into the right retailers and that they're presenting this product right. And so how can I as a supplier or as a you know, producer or manufacturer or whatever, um, how can I ensure that um, the image, the product, the placement, all of these, these pieces that I care about in terms of how I want my product represented are done correctly? Well, this is what we call channel cooperation. So we, we have these different, um, different um, ways that we can do this. One is we do a corporate distribution. In a corporate distribution, this means you just try and buy up every part of the channel of that distribution. So um, I'm going to be the manufacturer. I'm also going to have my own trucks. Um, I'm going to have my own delivery systems from there, my own warehousing, and I'm going to have my own retail outlets so that I can control that entire process. Okay? That would be your corporate distribution. Then you might have uh, another way of going about it. it. Might be some sort of contract distribution, and that's where you know it's just legally you try and you know bind the stuff up. So um, there's some contractual agreement that you have to do it a certain way. This is an example where we'd say this is what a franchise does. A franchise has a contractual you know uh, obligation to present the product or service in a certain way. Another way you might handle it would be to um, just administer the distribution. So this is where you, you volunteer to help um, those in, in the rest of this channel to um, handle their marketing, handle their, you know, just manage all of the, the marketing and the, the displays and the inventory controls and, you know, all of these pieces. You'd say, hey, you know, I know this is hard and there's a lot of challenges. Why don't I come along and help you with that? And so this is where um, you would see a, a representative from the company that would go to the retailer and provide service in terms of teaching the, the, the salespeople how to sell the product, informing them and educating them. So easy example would be, uh, and I don't know if this is the actual case, but like at Best Buy, um, if I was Nokia, I would have a you know a training representative from Nokia go and visit the Best Buy stores and talk to those that are selling cell phones and selling the coverages. And I would explain to them, say, hey, you know, here's some materials uh, that you can hand out to your uh, people that are interested. Here's kind of some background about Nokia, and you just educate. Um, these salespeople so that when somebody comes in, the salespeople are, you know, totally trained and know all of the information they need to to sell the Nokia products. And so this is what we call the administered distribution. And so that's one, that's yet another way of, of how you can um, try and ensure that your product is working properly. This is a good point for me to bring up something that the book doesn't discuss. And that is, we're talking about channel cooperation, but there's also what we call channel conflict. So in channel conflict, I may be selling, and let's get some, let's get some graphs going here. So let's bring our players into this. So I, as a manufacturer, <clears throat> may be working through a wholesaler to get my product to a retailer which would then give my product to an end consumer. So I'm moving product from manufacturing into my distribution, from my distribution to my retailer, and ultimately to my end consumer. Now back to our first point about intermediaries. I as a manufacturer might get very excited about this idea that, hey, why don't I start selling product directly to my end consumer? And I'm going to do this over the internet. Right? Because, hey, you know, consumers would like to buy off the internet, and maybe I can just have one person that just fulfills orders. So that'll be pretty easy. But what happens is you create a conflict. 
Specifically, um, the most notable one is right here. This, is, this causes the channel conflict right here because your retailer owns that activity between them and the consumer. And yet you are trying to reach out to that same consumer. So where is this consumer going to uh, buy their product from? Well, it just depends. They start looking at it and they say, I can get the same product from here, and I can get the same product from here, thanks to the wonderful internet. So, which one are they going to go with? Well, they'll probably realize that if it's the exact same product, the exact same warranty, because, you know, that's how it is, then it becomes a question of price. Right? Why would I go to the retailer when I could buy it cheaper on the internet? This causes a huge conflict because this is your, you, you know, your customer. Okay? Under your previous process here, you didn't actually have interaction with the consumer. You know, you marked it as a sale when you know they sold it. You know? and so that's that's your primary relationship. But you make a case now, oh, well, now I'm trying to uh, create this other relationship here, and that just causes a conflict there. Customer goes, well, you know, I look at it in terms of price. So while we can have channel cooperation, we also can have channel conflict. And there are certain strategies that if we had more time to discuss, you would you would employ these. You would say, um, you know, I need to differentiate my product, offer it at a very different pricing structure, or do something so that I can avoid this, what we call channel conflict. Now, finishing up what we're talking about, uh, let's talk about some of the logistics. Now, we've been talking about, you know, how we get the product to the end consumer, but logistics is the area of the business that deals with the actual physical movement of the stuff. So when we're talking about inbound logistics, we're talking about bringing in the raw materials or the packaging, all of that stuff to the producer. The materials handling area is what we're talking about when we say um, they're taking the material and they're moving it around in the warehouse or creating you know, the, the final product. Then there's the logistics of the outbound, which is getting it out of the factory and to the warehouser or whatever. And then you have the ultimate issue, which is, you know, when there's a, a return, how do you handle that? Where does it go? So logistics is the um, area of the business that focuses on the physical movement of these products. The way that the logistics department will focus on these is literally looking at the different modes of transportation. So, product can be moved by rail car, can be moved by uh, trucks. It can, you know, depending on the product, it can be put on boats. Um, it could be pushed through a pipeline. It could be traveled by air, or you get this uh, what we call intermodal. And when we say intermodal, um, what we're saying is it, it, somebody figures out that you know, it's a combination of activities. So it's not just one of them. It's you know it starts by highway and then it ends up um, you know going on a boat and then ultimately it you know flies into a destination. Then it's put on a truck and you know you just do whatever it takes to get it there. And uh, part of that process um, is where you're dealing with these intermediaries. And one of them uh, is what we call a freight forwarder. And that's where they'll put the freight forwarder will put many of the small shipments together. So if I've got a delivery that I need to make to, you know, some very small town or something like that, um, you'll go to a freight forwarder who will um, give you a cheaper price than if you, you know, had to, to, to send it um, um, through through one particular route because they can. You know, if they've got a truck that's heading in that area, they can drop it off and it'll be cheaper and, and usually a little faster for you. It's important to note that in each of these different areas, 
there's some sort of like storage and or distribution that needs to happen, i.e. there's got to be some warehouse where this stuff is put. So when a product comes off of a ship, it's not able to just be put directly on a car because you don't have enough cars that are set up. Um, you don't have enough train, you know, box cars or whatever available all the time. So product has to sit in some sort of warehousing, has to be stored uh, from time to time as part of the transportation process. This concludes the lecture on chapter 15. Thank you for watching. And remember, the more you know, the more you learn, the more options and the more opportunities that you have. Thanks for watching.